Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the sixth webinar in the Cardiovascular Connections 2022 series. Today's webinar is titled Cardiac Research Using Microelectrode Array Technology, Methodology Considerations and Best Practices to Optimize Recording, featuring Dr. George Portugal, Senior Application Scientist at Harvard Bioscience. Today, he's going to give us an overview of microelectrode array technology used for cardiac research and some best practices for integrating this technique into your research. Before we get started, we'd just like to acknowledge our partners at the American Physiological Society and the European Council for Cardiovascular Research, and a special shout out to our session sponsor, Harvard Bioscience, for helping to make this event possible. Harvard Bioscience has been empowering researchers and driving advancements in life sciences for over 100 years. Our solutions are used around the globe by researchers studying the cardiovascular system, metabolism, nervous systems, respiratory inhalation, infectious diseases, and more. From molecular analysis and whole cell or slice electrophysiology assays, to characterizing changes to organs or tissues in a controlled environment absent of external factors, all the way to whole animal stress-free physiological data collection and automated behavioral assessments. Our proven solutions, combined with world-class services and support, are used by the scientific community throughout many stages of their research, where we have been cited in over 375,000 research publications. Our team is with you every step of the way. Whether it's your first study or you've been working with us for years, let Harvard Bioscience be your partner in research. So thanks so much for being with us today, George, and you can take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, so first I just wanted to thank everyone for taking time to uh, attend this discussion about uh, cardiac research using uh, microelectrode rays. And we're going to uh, just start with a little overview here. So, um, so what we're going to be doing in this conversation is first starting with a discussion of cardiac safety and drug uh, development, uh, going through some of the more common uh, and popular assays and some of their advantages and disadvantages, um, and then transitioning into a conversation about patch clamp electrophysiology, um, which you know one could consider as a, a gold standard for uh, for cardiac safety. Um, and then uh, from there, going into a conversation about microelectrode array technology and um, what that can do uh, for uh, facilitating drug development and showing you guys some examples in cell culture, slice, and whole heart preparations, um, some of the advantages and disadvantages of this technology, and then also talking about some of the best practices uh, that are um, available for, um, for, for integrating this technique into your lab. I'm also going to just briefly mention a little bit about myself. So I'm an application scientist, uh, part of Harvard Biosciences team for electrophysiology. And so we um, have both in vitro and in vivo uh, complete uh, solutions for, um, for whole cell patch, for uh, microelectroarray, um, for telemetry, uh, isolated organ. And um, so yeah, obviously feel free to contact me and I can assist with any of your needs related to those, um, to those research uh, techniques. So cardiovascular disease uh, continues to be a very serious health and economic issue in the United States and abroad. Uh, so for instance, in the United States, there's an estimated 700,000 people uh, that die each year from cardiac disease. That's about one in five deaths. And the economic costs of uh, cardiovascular disease is also quite high. It's about $219 billion each year. So it's really clear that we need to uh, have a better understanding of the progression of this disease and how to treat it and also preventative measures so that these, these costs can uh, come down. Cardiac safety is also a very critical component of drug development. Um, so for instance, one of the uh, critical um, tests as part of FDA um, for, for assessing cardiac safety for new compounds is to look at Herg channel blockade. The Herg potassium channel um, is a primary reason for ventricular repolarization. And so um, any, any new tests of a, of, a, of a compound need to see whether um, it, it has any kind of modulation of, of, um, of the Herg channel. And so ideally, you know, when you're, when you're working with 
hundreds or maybe thousands of potential drug candidates, you really need an assay that can rapidly and accurately assess cardiac safety uh, parameters. Okay, so first I'm going to be going over um, some of the more commonly used uh, techniques to uh, assess HERC channel blockade. And so I'm going to start with uh, the voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes. And so essentially what these dyes do is uh, they, they, um, they relocate in the cell uh, when the cell membrane potential changes. So it's, they'll, they'll either go from the outside to the inside of the cell or vice versa when there's a change in voltage. And so these changes can be uh, quantified. And so this is um, the advantages to using this technique for looking at her channel blockade is that it's very easy to handle. There's very high throughput and uh, the cost is quite low. Um, however, there are a number of disadvantages to using voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes. One is that the, uh, the temporal resolution is a bit slow when compared to electrophysiology, which is you know, basically instantaneous. And uh, another critical disadvantage here is that it's not uh, directly measuring changes in her channel blockade. It's, it's just simply looking at changes in, in uh, membrane potential, which of course is correlated, but it's, it's not a direct measurement of, of say her channel blockade. Okay, so another classical technique that is, that is used um, to look at her channel blockade is defetilide binding. And so in this technique, what you have is bound tritium labeled defetilide, and you, you look to see whether this is replaced by a test compound. Um, and so if, if, um, if your drug candidate has a competitive affinity to the binding domain of the HERD channel, then you'll, you'll, see, you'll see changes um, in, in uh, defetilide binding. So there are some advantages to this technique. It's, it's easy to handle, and it is a direct assay of HERG affinity, but there are, of course, some disadvantages as well. One is that you are working with radioactive compounds, and so there's a whole host of um, you know, hazard and safety issues affiliated with that. Um, another thing is that you're looking at affinity, but you're not actually looking to see whether there's a direct channel block using defetilide binding. So another very popular uh, technique that's used is to uh, measure rubidium efflux. And so with this assay, it's a non-radioactive assay, assay that measures the functional efflux of rubidium ions through potassium channels. And ideally, this is performed on cells that express the HERG channel. There are um, some advantages here, which is that this whole process can be automated. Um, however, there are multiple steps involved, and there are higher costs per, um, per data point, and there are potentials for false positives using this kind of assay. Okay, so finally, we're going to discuss patch clamp electrophysiology, and patch clamp electrophysiology is widely considered to be the gold standard for measuring herd channel blockades. So with with patch, you're um, directly going into the cardiomyocyte, looking at the HERD channels and holding uh, membrane potentials and then directly measuring currents. So this very clearly can tell you if HERD channels are being um, blocked by a compound of interest. So there are some very big disadvantages with this technique. One is that the throughput is very slow. You can only go through a few cells at a time. It takes a lot of time and energy just to train people to be proficient in this technique. You also need large volumes of test compounds, so this can also be rather costly, especially if it takes um, quite a bit of um, you know, resources to, to get large volumes of these test compounds. And if you're dealing with tens of thousands of potential um, candidates, then this becomes very prohibitive. There are ways around this using automated patch clamp, and so with automated patch clamp, you do have very high throughput. Um, but not all types of patch clamp electrophysiology can be done in this manner. So it's really just the whole cell configuration. You couldn't do inside out or outside out patch. Um, another issue is that the quality of the recordings is quite poor as compared to manual patch. And so as a result, you still need to have uh, lots of replicates um, and, and in order to get some kind of meaningful information um, using automated patch. So what about microelectrode array recordings? 
So for those of you that don't know, um, what, what I'll do first is just kind of go over a brief overview of, of what microelectrode arrays are and how they compare and contrast to other techniques in electrophysiology. So MEAs stands for either multi-electrode arrays or microelectrode arrays. You'll, you'll see different, um, you know, uh, abbreviations of this in the literature. And, and basically what it consists of is a network of electrodes that are plated onto either a glass substrate or a PCB substrate. And they're usually evenly dispersed, but they can be configured in a variety of different uh, layouts. And they're designed to do extracellular recordings of electrically active cells. So this could be uh, cardiac, could be uh, in the brain, could be the retina. It could also be in a few other preparations as well, such as the neuromuscular junction. The advantage to this technique is that when you're talking about uh, cardiomyocytes or um, neurons, these cells obviously do not work in isolation. They, in the case of cardiomyocytes, they are driven by a pacemaker and you see conduction across a three-dimensional space. And there are emergent properties of this network uh, of you know, signal transmission. So in, in the context of cardiology, you're, you're talking about looking at changes in conduction velocity, changes in T-wave, Q. QT prolongation, uh, arrhythmia, and in neuroscience, um, you can see um, synaptic plasticity as a result of these, these networks. And so, so it's important to not only look at single cells, but also to understand what's happening at a network-based level. And so that's the, the unique information that microelectrode arrays can provide. So I just have this uh, image here just to illustrate the different techniques in electrophysiology and, and how they compare with each other. And so you can see that with patch clamp, your, um, your, your glass pipette is going directly up to the cell membrane, removing a small section and then characterizing channels. Um, whereas the microelectrode array, you can see that it's positioned on, underneath the cardiomyocyte. So it's just recording extracellularly. And it's very similar to um, what you're seeing with the extracellular electrode here and what you're getting are, are field potentials. These are just some examples of different types of microelectrode arrays and looking at them under an electron microscope. So you can see that they're evenly spaced and uh, they're normally a 30 micron diameter um, electrode. They have a receptive field of about 100 microns. And so uh, typically, you know, the, the amplitude of, of the, uh, the cardiomyocyte signal is going to be contingent on proximity um, and also cell type as well. So when you're talking about neurons, you see different types of amplitudes depending on the cell type. But with cardiomyocytes, it's pretty uniform. It's more a function of how close are the cardiomyocytes to uh, the electrode themselves. And so, yes, as you can see in the bottom of this image, there's lots of different types of layouts depending on what, what's needed for um, you know, the specific study that's being uh, conducted. It's also possible to take MEAs and adapt them to a multi-wall format. And so this is obviously advantageous for cardiac safety because you could screen lots of candidates um, for, for changes in say QT prolongation and, and, uh, and measure that um, either using like a 24 well plate or 96 well, or even these smaller six well or nine well formats. So this will allow you to easily screen out lots of potential candidates and, and focus on the ones that are the most promising. Okay, so here in this slide, I just have an example of uh, what MEAs um, look like in an actual experiment. So you can see that the um, this is this is a monolayer of um, primary rodent cardiomyocytes, and so you can see that they're they're contracting, um, and and then overlaid here are the uh, field potential responses. So you can see the QRS component, and you can see the T wave clearly following after that. Okay, so in this uh, slide right here, what we have is human iPSC uh, derived cardiomyocytes. And uh, so what we're, what we're seeing here is a multi-well plate. So it's a 24 well plate with, um, I believe these were axiogenesis um, uh, iPSC derived cardiomyocytes. And so you can see them uh, you know, beating on this particular well. You can also see the uh, conduction velocity in the lower right with the, the multicolored image right there. And you can see where, where the signal is propagating uh, from, the, from the lower left and then going outward um, from, you know, into the upper right. And then finally here, I have an example using a single 
well, uh, I'm sorry, a, a single um, MEA, which is divided into six wells. And, and so this is just a close up of one of the wells. You can see five of them um, have cardiomyocytes. The sixth one is, is not populated. And then uh, there's a close up of, of uh, one channel where you can see the QRS component and the T wave. Okay, so what type of information can you obtain from um, microelectrode arrays uh, using, using cardiomyocytes? So one very important thing that you can examine is QT prolongation. And so QT prolongation is a biomarker of ventricular repolarization. It's also associated with Herd channel blockade. And so what you can see here is a, uh, an image from um, Meyer and colleagues from 2007. So this is using uh, a microelectrode array recording system and looking at dose dependent uh, effects on QT prolongation. And so you can see that um, you can very easily identify T wave using a microelectrode array and uh, screen with a wide variety of compounds and seeing if there, there is uh, this effect. And uh, furthermore, we can also accomplish this with a uh, 96 well plate. So again, that'll allow you to look at multiple candidates uh, at once. You can also adapt uh, this technique to look at cardiac slice as well. So this is rodent, um, these are rodent uh, cardiac slices that have been uh, attached to a microelectrode array. And so what you can see here in the upper left is just an image of the slice on the MEA. And then on the right hand side, you can see, um, it's a bit small, but you can see uh, the, the um, responses from, from, the, uh, from the cells on the slice. And then on the bottom here is kind of like a, a sequence of the conduction velocity on the slice. So you can see that the, uh, the beats begin in uh, the lower right hand corner of the slice, and then they propagate to the upper left um, as a function of time. So another advantage to the microelectrode array technology is that you can also measure changes in field action potentials. So ordinarily, um, when you're recording just from spontaneously beating cardiomyocytes, what you see is an image uh, like figure A in the upper left where you get the QRS component and the T wave. But if you um, electrically stimulate the cardiomyocytes, you'll get a field action potential, which is what you can see here in uh, figure B. And this field action potential can also be modulated um, by, by, by compounds. So, so you can... Um, you can change the duration of the field action potential, and that's what you're seeing here in uh, the bottom four figures. And you can also monitor changes in the rate and conduction velocity of these field action potentials. So again, this can be uh, done with cardiac slice. This can also be done with, um, with, with cell culture and in a single well plate format or in a multi well plate format. So it's ideally suited for, for screening. And then finally, uh, you can take microelectrode array technology and adapt it to a whole heart preparation as well. So what you see here in this image is a Langendorf heart preparation on, on the left-hand side. And, and then here in the center panel, uh, what you're seeing is these flexible microelectrode arrays, which are commercially available. And these can be positioned with a micromanipulator in various positions on the heart. So they can be in the atria, the ventricle, um, and they can be, you know, either fixed for the duration of the experiment or they could potentially be moved. And so you can, you can monitor arrhythmic events in real time. You can monitor, um, you know, standard field potentials and also field action potentials as well. So it's possible to stimulate and record in, in this uh, kind of configuration. One nice uh, feature of microelectrode array technology as well is that it has a very small physical footprint in the lab. So it's possible to take this technology and combine it with other approaches. Um, so just, just to be clear, you know, all of the, the different assays that I've discussed, it's not to say that one is necessarily better than another. They're all complementary toward the same goal. And what's nice, at least about the MEAs, is that you can use them in combination with um, techniques such as patch clamp, um, and that's actually what you're seeing here in this in this setup right here is a patch clamp uh, rig, and there's also a microelectrode array system overlaid here with with um, this system, so that you can record um, from say her channels directly on cardiomyocytes, and then 
also simultaneously uh, record um, MEA data as well. It's also possible to combine MEA technology with imaging techniques as well. So you could also use it in, in a, um, uh, with fluorescent imaging, with calcium imaging and fluorescently labeled cells. Um, and then it also complements well with other types of cellular and molecular techniques, which are done sequentially, where you do, uh, you know, microelectron array recording, and then immediately follow with something like uh, Western blots or PCR to look at changes in uh, protein expression or gene expression. Okay, so there are a number of methodological considerations to have if you're thinking about adding microelectrode arrays into your existing uh, setup. So there are quite a number of contrasts when you look at MEAs compared to a traditional patch clamp electrophysiology rig. Um, so setting up a MEA recording system is quite uh, a simple process by comparison. So when you're setting up a new electrophysiology rig, it usually involves integrating several different instruments together, and it can be rather costly, time consuming, and it has a very large footprint in the lab. In contrast, an MEA recording system is physically small. It's something that you know one could potentially even carry in a backpack. So it's it's very it's very simple to um, take it and set it up on the bench, move it around. In fact, there are some some groups that I work with where they actually have it on a cart because multiple groups are using it, and so you can cart it from one one lab space to another. Um, it's also something that does not require a lot of training. So when, when training to do patch clamp electrophysiology, you can expect that it takes about six months to a year to get an investigator really fully running and understanding all of the principles and dealing with all of the technical uh, challenges with getting patch clamp running. In contrast with uh, MEA, it, it takes much less time um, because the, the real obstacles are more about um, getting optimal cultures ready, getting your, your actual prep ready. And when, once that's all set, the recording is actually pretty simple. Um, because there are fewer components, there are also less issues with, uh, with noise, whether it's electrical noise or mechanical noise. This is something that can be a real challenge um, when you're doing patch clamp electrophysiology because you have lots of different components. You have an amplifier, the air table, temperature control, uh, stimulation, all of those are separate components. All of them can generate noise. And so isolating that can be a, an issue. Whereas with Pat, uh, with, um, with MEA, you really only have one or two components. And so it's much easier to get, you know, troubleshooting issues uh, resolved. And then finally, yes, I did mention portability. The, the systems that are used for these kinds of recordings are, are quite small. So it makes it very easy to move them around um, or combine them with other technology. So for cell culture on MEAs, um, what I find when I'm working with a variety of different labs is that most of the time I can take their existing protocols and use them directly on MEAs. So if you're already accustomed to you know, working with primary cultures or iPSC-derived cultures, the techniques that you're currently using in the lab for coding and for sterilization are probably going to be identical or very minor modifications are needed in order to use them with MEAs. But I feel like this might be one of the, the, the biggest obstacles in the beginning is if a lab is not used to working with cell culture, then that's something that they really kind of have to overcome before they can do these kinds of recordings. Um, but if there are already you know, veterans with this, then, then usually they can get MEAs operational very quickly. To that end, we do have a list of application notes that we can provide um, and there's also a MEA manual, which has a whole host of coding and sterilization protocols that can be used. Um, another issue is optimal cell density. So, so in order to get you know, quality recordings, um, if the density is too sparse, then, then you're not going to see um, consistent or reliable results. And then conversely, if the density is too high, then really you're not gonna get um, consistent data either. So, so normally when setting up MEAs in the lab, I always recommend to do um, a variety of different densities. And this is really easy to do on a multi-well where you can just adjust different densities and just find like what's the optimal density for getting uh, reliable and consistent data. Um, another final important thing is that the microelectrode 
arrays are reusable. So they're not a single use item. They can be, they can be cleaned, uh, they can be sterilized and reused. And so just making sure that um, you follow those protocols that you know we provide and that are also available um, in publications. And, and that will ensure that from one experiment to the other, that you get the same kind of um, results. For cardiac slice, um, there are a number of other methodological considerations that should be um, taken. For, for one is that unlike uh, other techniques with patch clamp, the, the electrodes in an MEA are fixed in position. So, so with patch, you, you move your electrodes in X, Y, and Z coordinates. So when you're dealing with a three-dimensional piece of tissue, like a piece of a, a cardiac slice, if the surface cells are in poor shape, it really doesn't matter because you can take your electrodes and you can move um, into the tissue and record deeper. With MEA, that's not possible because the electrodes themselves are plated. They're plated onto a glass substrate or a PCB substrate. So what that means is that the sectioning of um, cardiac tissue has to be very clean. It's really critical that you have a really good vibratome um, that that can reliably and cleanly section the tissue. Uh, also making sure that the, the tissue is properly oxygenated and healthy um, before those recordings because everything is on the surface. Um, related to that, it's also very important that the tissue makes very good contact with the MEAs themselves. So that means that you have to use something like tyroid solution. You, you, you can't have very strong um, contractions uh, as a, because um, that means that the, the contact between the MEA and the slice will not be consistent. Um, and then there's also other tools that you can add into the mix um, to ensure good contact. And so I list them here. One is to use a harp, which basically consists of a stainless steel ring and a nylon mesh. And this mesh and ring basically weigh down the cardiac slice so that there's good contact between the electrode and the slice. Um, another possible um, approach is to use perforated microelectrode arrays. And so these are microelectrode arrays that have um, channels for perfusion to run that are adjacent to the electrodes. And the idea with this technique is that you use a peristaltic pump or a vacuum pump uh, to, to suction the slice into position. And you use like an optimal amount of suction, like maybe 0.1 mLs per minute. And that will ensure a very consistent contact between the slice and the MEA. And as a result, you'll have you know, very good recordings. Um, with regard to Langendorf heart, there are similar kinds of issues, um, which is that you, you really need a good um, mechanical manipulator that can hold the flexible microelectrode array in place um, so that it's not uh, moving around, not wobbling. And, and similarly, contraction can also um, potentially create issues here. If you have very strong contractions, then um, your MEA might be moving around and your recording quality will, will not be good. Um, to, to that end, there are some flexible microelectrode arrays that are made of polyamide, which has a similar flexibility as like hair. So it's very, you know, very flexible. And so it will move as the heart moves. And so then in that case, contractions don't really have any kind of um, effect on, um, on, on, the, on the noise of the system. And then finally, um, there are a number of, of considerations to have when it comes to data analysis. So with MEA recordings, it's, it's very different from a lot of other techniques where um, other techniques like say patch clamp, you're spending a lot of time collecting data, like many, many hours collecting data. And then data analysis is actually a rather fast process. And so many, many techniques in the lab kind of follow that sort of logic. MEAs are definitely not like that. So once, once you have MEA recordings going on consistently in the lab, um, you can expect to do 10 to 15 minutes of recording and then have a very large quantity of data. So you actually spend a fair amount of time analyzing data. And so, so that means that if you're doing high throughput data collection, you also need some automation for, for analysis because otherwise um, you're just creating a new bottleneck for yourself. And so a lot of the um, MEA data analysis software that's available um, provides a very standardized automated method for detecting signals and doing uh, preliminary analysis. Um, 
it's also important that when doing analysis that you you have the ability to uh, export it to other platforms such as uh, MATLAB, Python, or other types of data analysis scripting language. Because um, because again, if if you're if you're trying to do all of this manually and you have tens of thousands of data points, it's it's not practical. You're you're you know not going to be you're you're going to be negating all of that high throughput data collection that you obtain from from a MEA recording system. Uh, so the software that um, multi-channel systems provides, in particular, allows for that kind of easy export, easy automation. Um, and then finally, it's it's important to think of MEAs beyond just uh, the space of recording from cardiomyocytes. You can really think of them as a holistic approach to drug development. So when looking at um, safety of a compound, it's it's more than just looking at, at the heart, but you can also look at um, neuronal safety as well, um, or just uh, looking at the effects on a whole host of organs. And so the advantage to using um, microelectrode arrays is that is that it, it can be used in a wide variety of preparations. And so I have a few listed here. So you can look at um, neuronal cell cultures, uh, retinal cell cultures, cardiomyocytes, you can look at slices from all three of these different organs. Um, you can look at neuromuscular junction. You can look in the periphery as well. So it it, it can give you basically multi organs on a chip to really assess the, um, the consequences of, of what this new compound is doing on a whole host of organs. So I'd also like to mention, we do have a number of resources. If you're new to MEA recording and, and you need some more information, we have a wide variety of application notes that are on um, our website. We also have a very large list of publications, like over a thousand publications using MEA technology um, with uh, cardiac research, uh, neuroscience research. And so feel free to contact me afterwards and I can certainly share that information with you as well. And so hopefully, you know, this discussion um, makes it clear that microelectrode arrays are a very powerful tool for um, using in the context of cardiac safety and drug development because you can you can obtain a large amount of data in a very short period of time. It's, um, it's very easy to train um, investigators in this technique, and you can directly measure things like heart channel function in using a microelectrode array uh, recording system. Um, there are methodological challenges, but I think in comparison to patch clamp, um, they're, they're not as insurmountable. So as long as you have uh, reliable cell culture protocols um, and, and protocols for working with cardiac slice and laying it apart, I believe that it's a technology that you can get up and running very quickly. It's also nice because it complements a lot of these other techniques um, like Volchett sensitive dyes or uh, radio ligand binding or also with patch. And so uh, together, they can give you a really rich picture of, of what your compounds are doing. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank all of you for, for attending. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, to help. Thanks so much for that, George. A fantastic presentation. So George, the first question here is, do you have any suggestions for speeding up the data analysis process? Sometimes I end up detecting beats multiple times, and then I have to remove the duplicates before continuing with the analysis. OK, so that's actually a really good question. And it's something that I do get uh, from time to time. Um, and, and it's an important one, because like I was just saying a few moments ago, like if, if you're collecting lots of data rapidly, but then have major bottlenecks with analysis, it kind of defeats the whole the whole purpose of, of what's going on. So I'm just gonna go back to an earlier slide right here, um, just showing uh, just, just some examples of <clears throat> you know, data recorded from cell culture. And I, I would say, so, so I can speak very uh, clearly about the multi-channel systems uh, software because that's what our, our company provides. And so the, the way that it normally detects events is by looking at the standard deviation of the background noise and it, it We'll, we'll calculate that for about a second, and then it'll set a cutoff of plus or minus five standard deviations. So for, for cardiomyocytes, what I typically do is I set a negative cutoff only. Uh, the reason why is because, as you can kind of see in this image here, the, the, the T wave sometimes ends up getting double counted, and I think that's probably what's happening 
in, in your particular case is that um, <clears throat> the T wave is also upward deflect, deflecting and it often is five standard deviations higher than the background noise. So you'll end up double counting each beat as a result. So if you, if you only look five standard deviations below, um, you'll just catch the QRS component, which is usually very large. Um, and then just make sure that your analysis window is such that you're looking at a wide enough interval of time. So, so often I'll, I'll set that to somewhere between uh, 500 to 700 milliseconds, just to make sure I capture all of it plus the T wave. Um, and, and that will save you a lot of time. I, I think if, if you spend time <clears throat> in, the, in the beginning with, with um, making sure that the beats are being reliably and consistently detected, then all of the rest of the automation of data analysis will, will be a lot faster and, and easier. Awesome. Okay, thanks. Hopefully that answered uh, your question. Um, next question here is a similar uh, kind of type of question. It's uh, about their work. So this person has said, I work with MEAs and sometimes I have trouble with cell attachment. At first the cells adhere, but after a few days, they no longer attach to the MEA. Can you give some suggestions on how to improve this? Yeah, so this is also something that I run into um, from time to time. And I think the main culprit here is, is the fact that all MEAs are slightly hydrophobic. Um, and so, especially if they're, they're, they're brand new, this hydrophobicity is like really more pronounced. The, the more you have them, the more cell cultures you run on them, this reduces as a function of time. And I guess like, you know, cleaning cycles, sterilization cycles. Um, so uh, one thing I will do with all of the MEAs is I'll, I'll store them um, usually overnight in four degrees, um, you know, filled with DI water. Um, and, and that will help. You can also plasma clean um, most types of MEAs as well, and that reduces the hydrophobicity of the of the substrate. Um, and then, as far as like coating and plating protocols for for chiromyces in particular, I really like using fibronectin. And we do have a number of protocols on our website specifically for for chiromyces. Um, so my guess is that that's kind of what's going on here. It might be it might be the fact that they're slightly hydrophobic. Okay, perfect. Hopefully that helps you out. Um, next question here. Is it necessary to use an air table and Faraday cage to isolate the MEA system during recording? Okay, cool. Um, that, that is also another kind of question I get um, from time to time, especially from investigators that are accustomed to electrophysiology, like, like patch clamp, where you have a very large setup with a big air table and an inverted microscope and all the bells and whistles that are associated with that. And so the answer really depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're working with, with cell culture, um, then I would say the answer is emphatically no. Um, you, can, you can run those experiments just on the bench if you need to. You don't even necessarily need a microscope of any kind. Um, I mean, it might be helpful in some cases, but it's very optional. Um, and you should be able to get, um, you know, consistent and clean results uh, from that. However, if you're, if you're working with something like cardiac slice and you might be running continuous perfusion and suction, then in that case, it may be advantageous to have an air table. But again, it's not as mandatory as it is for, um, for patch clamp where it's absolutely required to have an, an isolation table. Um, so my suggestion is, is that I would, I would try it on the bench first before committing to you know, all of that extra physical space and cost of, of getting an air table because it, may, it most likely is not needed. Okay, great. Um, this question is a long one, so I'll give you some context. Um, this person is asking about uh, Langendorf heart preps in small animals okay. like mice. Um, so he's asked, often when using MEAs in the atrial uh, in the atria, sorry, of small animals, mm -hmm. the signal is contaminated with far field potential coming from the ventricles. Do you have any advice on how to avoid this? Yeah, that I've seen that myself. Um, that can be difficult to deal with. Um, it, I think I think the biggest thing is positioning on the atria, like proximity to the ventricles matters. I think the, the further away you can get away with being, I think the 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 better your chances are of not seeing that. Um, you might also be able to get away with filtering it out uh, in post-processing. So depending on 
um, what types of filters you're using during recording. I mean, you might just be recording raw data. Um, and, and I guess that's something, if you feel like following up with me after the fact, I'd be happy to discuss it with you as well. Um, but, but yeah, I think that it's might be possible to remove those, um, after the fact using, using filter, some kind of a filter. Um, but again, it would be, it's tough to do this without actually seeing it as well. Like it would be nice to see an actual example. So please, I'd be happy to see your data and discuss it with you and in more detail that way. But those would be the two methods I would suggest, maybe changing positioning a little bit, and then also considering using uh, some kind of a filter to, to remove it. Okay, so Carlos, yeah, you can reach out to George. Um, his contact info is on our website uh, if you're interested in reaching out to him directly. Um, we've got another question here. Uh, it kind of made me chuckle a little. Do you have to be a trained electrophysiologist to set this up and conduct MEA experiments? Yeah, so the answer to that is emphatically no. <laughs> so I, I did say this a little bit in the discussion that um, the process of learning MEA is very different from um, conventional patch clamp electrophysiology. From my own personal experience, I learned I learned patch and extracellular recording first, and and it did take me time. It took me a good you know six months to a year to get proficient at at those techniques. Um, and the data collection is slow. And it was only much later when I was doing my postdoc that I learned about MEA. And I was actually really like kind of mad at first because I was like, why didn't I learn this sooner? Um, because you you don't need to be uh, an experienced electrophysi electrophysiologist to 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 do um, MEA recordings. I think I think the biggest obstacle is is really can you can you you know grow consistent clean cell cultures if you're working with cell cultures or if you're working with slice or you are you are you you know using a very good clean sectioning protocol but the actual recording itself I, I feel like it's something that can be done by a technician and in fact I have trained many a technician uh, to do it so so if you're working in the drug development space that's great you don't have to have someone with like extensive EFIS background to run MEA projects um, so yeah that's definitely a good question there that's fantastic. And there's a, sort of a follow up to that. Um, this person has mm -hmm. asked if you or your company provide guidance on cell culture techniques to help ensure the MEA recordings are the best that they can be. Um, they basically, I've paraphrased it, but they've said that proper cell culture is pretty important, it seems. So um, do you basically offer guidance? Yeah. yeah, and that's just what I was saying before that, yeah, cell culture is, it, the quality of it is critical. and. And yeah, to that end, we have a very large um, library of, of resources that are available for, um, for existing and prospective customers where we have detailed protocols on, on how to um, you know, run a, a culture from beginning to end. We have cleaning and sterilization protocols, coding methods. Um, and then aside from that, we have a very large library of publications, like well over a thousand publications using this technology in the context of cardiomyocyte research and, and also with uh, neuronal recordings as well. And, and that's, you know, th that process of helping people is something I do quite often. So yeah, absolutely, we can assist with that. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, if you have questions for George about cell cultures, you can reach out to him directly too. Um, okay, yeah. next question here. Well, first it says, thank you for your presentation. And next, the person has asked, how representative is the MEA QT interval to the surface ECG QT? And how do you calculate QTC? Okay, so I can answer, I think, most of that question. <laughs> so I know that um, in terms of the MEA QT interval, um, there actually are a few studies comparing QT prolongation on MEA and, and just simply comparing it to a standard surface ECG QT. And, and so the intervals are, are pretty closely matched. Um, compounds that prolong QT work in the same manner. Like if you're doing like a dose dependent study, like just trying to figure out what, a, what, what dose most optimally in, it prolongs or, or, you know, QT, uh, you'll find that it's um, apples to apples when you're looking at surface ECG versus MEA QT. Now, I am less, so my, just as a brief mention, my background is more in neuroscience than in, in, in uh, cardiology. And so I, I'm less knowledgeable about how QTC is calculated per se. That being said, the, the software that we have does uh, automate a lot of that. And there's, there's details in the documentation of it, precisely how it's done. It can also be adjusted uh, according to the user specifications as well, but, but it's not my, my forte. And so I'd rather, you know, just 
simply explain that we have the, the information available, but it's not something I know offhand. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, another question here. <clears throat> This person has asked, um, I saw that you have planar like MEAs. Um, do you have any 3D MEAs that help detect electrophysiological signals um, that can be recorded globally? Yeah, that's um, <clears throat> actually a very good question. And we do, in fact, have three dimensional MEAs available. So, um, so one of the products that we provide is the um, MEA 2100 60 channel system. And that has the broadest number of layouts. There's maybe 60 or more different types of MEA layouts for that instrument. And about maybe two or so years ago, we developed these three-dimensional MEAs. And so the way that they work is that they're evenly distributed in a square layout. They're maybe about 200 microns apart from each other. And if you look at them under an electron microscope, they're actually like pyramidal in shape. And <clears throat> they're fully insulated except for the tip. And so the tip is where the recording happens. And at the tip, I believe they're 30 microns in diameter. And so we actually sell varying heights. Um, and so I think the, the, the highest in terms of heights is maybe 100 microns in height. Um, and so what's nice about that is that you could use that with an organoid. You could use that with a slice preparation or really any kind of three-dimensional culture. Um, and so then you can record more deeply into the tissue. So yeah, that's absolutely something that you can purchase from us and use. <clears throat> awesome. I'll just say there is a brochure for the product that was just mentioned, Peach. If you want to check out the resources tab, um, the ME2100 brochure is in there. Um, so you can take a look at that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep going if you're good to go, George. Sure. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah. Okay, uh, we've got tons of questions. So it's really great. So this person has asked, is it possible to measure latency between two chambers of a two chamber MEA? Um, I think so. It's a, it's a tricky question. So I guess by, I might ask you to clarify. So, so, so what you mean here is, is <clears throat> latency between the two of them. So, so I mean, normally, so with a two chamber MEA, both cultures are completely independent from each other. So, um, you know, you're, if you had two monolayers of cardiomyocytes on both, you know, they'd be beating spontaneously, they'd be doing their own thing. But one of the advantages of the hardware is that you can actually use the real-time DSP in our hardware to make the two chambers interact with each other. Um, so for example, if um, you, you can, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's this dynamic real-time feedback mechanism that's built into the hardware. So you could take spontaneous beats from, say, culture A and use that as a stimulus to drive culture B. Um, so that way, the two cultures are interacting with each other. And then, yeah, I suppose in that kind of setting, you could measure something like latency. Um, so that's not a common kind of application, but the hardware is capable of it. And I'm assuming that's what you meant by, by latency here. But if, if not, then please clarify, and I can try to address it differently. Yeah. So Praveen, if you want to send in another uh, question to clarify, if he, yeah. if he didn't answer your question, please do so. Um, we've got another question here. This person has asked, uh, can you tell us about slice attachment? Um, he said that you are presuming that these are slice cultures and can you compare recording resolutions between acute and cultured slices? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so attachment is like a really critical thing um, because like I kind of said earlier in the discussion that, you know, if, if, if it's too far away from the electrodes, you're really gonna get nothing or very, very weak beats. Uh, and then of course the opposite is also problematic. If you're squishing the heck out of the slice, then it's gonna be in bad shape. Uh, you're not gonna get consistent results from, from something like that either. Um, and, and you can, you could do a slice culture, or you could actually do a fresh acute slice with the MEA as well. Um, either option is possible. We have protocols for both types of preparations. Um, as far as what the data look like, um, it's it's a pretty similar kind of experience. I mean, although with a, you know, with a slice, you you have geography. So you know, when you're looking at atrial, you know, uh, waveforms, they're going to look atrial in nature. If you're looking ventricular, they're going to look ventricular. So that's, that's different from like a monolayer where the cells are going to do what they want. And, and in those kinds of preparations, you know, they're mostly going to look ventricular, I would say, unless you're trying to do something to specifically enrich for atrial. Um, and so the other thing too, is that conduction velocity is 
is is going to be a lot more consistent between recordings or, or a little bit more uh, relevant in that sense because you've got your pacemaker there and you can see it propagating across across the slice. Um, but as far as the question of, of attachment, the attachment, there's two ways of doing it. One is through using something like a harp, which is just a piece of uh, stainless steel ring, usually with some nylon mesh, and the weight of the ring holds it down. The, the method I prefer, though, is to use perforated microelectrode arrays, and these are MEAs that have uh, channels for fluidics that are right near the electrodes, and you can either use a vacuum pump or a peristaltic pump to physically attach the slice to the MEA. Okay, fantastic. <clears throat> um, we've still got a couple more questions. We've got a bit more time, so I'm going to keep going. Um, this person sure. has asked, are there in vivo <clears throat> approaches that would complement the in vitro MEA um, to add to a holistic kind of viewpoint? Yeah, absolutely. So some of the other products that um, Harvard Bioscience, uh, you know, provides and supports would be the telemetry solutions from DSI. And so um, one of the things that you can use um, the telemetry instruments for is to continuously monitor blood pressure and heart rate. Um, you can also monitor changes in respiration as well. And so potentially all of these um, <clears throat> All of these solutions could be used in in tandem, or at least uh, sequentially. So, for instance, you know you could have in vivo studies going on in your lab where you're continuously monitoring these these changes um, in whole intact animals, and then following that up with say Langendorf heart preparation. So it's an intact whole organ, and you're doing uh, atrial or ventricular recordings with that, or potentially even uh, transitioning sequentially and doing um, you know cardiomyocyte recordings um, from a, from a model or from those same animals. So, so yeah, so the, the fact that we have all of these in vivo and in vitro approaches together gives you a real holistic idea of what's going on uh, with your specific research question. Okay, great. Uh, another question here. Do you have a preference for more wells with fewer electrodes per well versus fewer wells with more electrodes per well? That's a good question. And it really depends on your your research question itself, like that dictates more um, which option is, is the most ideal for, for your situation. So, so for instance, if you're really interested in arrhythmia, if you're really interested in changes in conduction velocity, then having fewer wells with a more dense electrode count is better for those kinds of conditions. Um, just because you can more accurately assess conduction velocity with that, you can more accurately um, you know, quantify an arrhythmic event with with that kind of a prep. Um, in contrast, if you're if you're simply looking at um, well, I shouldn't say simply, but if you're if you're looking at changes in in beat rate or changes in QT, then then and you have lots of compounds, lots of conditions, then then a multi well plate format is ideal for that kind of setting. And and the nice thing about the the products that we provide is that you really don't have to compromise on any of that. So we have. Um, a modular kind of design where you could have a head stage to do high throughput recording and then another head stage to do single well high density recordings and so with a single instrument you could accomplish both of those goals okay fantastic based on time i'm going to do one last question even though there's okay. a ton left um so this question is uh, can you comment on conduction quote unquote wavelength calculations or the assessment based on conduction velocity, for example, the re-entry possibility? Yeah, the probability of re-entry. Um, okay, so that's a, that's a tough one for me. Again, it kind of goes back to my my um, my background and my lack of, of depth on on, on um, data analysis with cardiology. I know, I know that, um, again, the instruments, the software that we provide can um, give you very rich information about the length of the waves, the, the the, the timing of conduction velocity and monitoring it in real time. And, and, and so you can, you could use that, I think, uh, in principle to calculate the probability of re-entry. Um, but it's something I would probably want to defer to my colleagues in Germany who, who have a deeper background on this. And so I'd be more than happy to follow up with you after the fact and, and get you in contact with the right folks at my organization to assist with it. Okay. Well, Thank you so much, uh, George, for your fantastic yep. insights, both during your presentation and the Q&A. We really appreciate having you here with us, and I hope that you had fun. Absolutely. I certainly did, yeah, and thanks all for, for attending. Great. Okay.
And I also want to send a very big thank you to our audience for joining us live. Um, and in closing, we hope that you enjoyed this Inside Scientific webinar sponsored by Harvard Bioscience and produced in partnership with the American Physiological Society and the European Council for Cardiovascular Research. And we look forward to having you with us for the rest of the series.